Um, my assignment here was to give, start out with kind of a primer on the Latino vote, a primer plus, I think is the way Tamara Jacoby put it. On, uh, so we're switching from the anecdotal and the personal um, uh, of the story of one politician to, um, to a few numbers um, here. And uh, bear with me to try and give a sense of, um, of what we know about the Latino vote and, um, and why it matters and where. Um, so the reason why we care about it um, is growth in numbers. Um, the startling, very fast, very rapid growth of the Latino population, um, starting with um, as the current wave of, of migration got going in the 1970s and the way it's projected um, to grow out through the rest of um, the century. Um, that translates into um, a growing share of the population, somewhere over 15% now headed um, based, depending on whose projections you believe, uh, towards a quarter of the population at mid-century, um, somewhere in that regard. This is the basic gut reason why people care about the Latino vote, just simple growth in numbers, um, growth at a time that the rest of the population, <clears throat> excuse me, um, isn't growing very quickly um, at a time when the non-white population in particular um, is basically stagnant in terms of its size, as is the, um, the African-American population. Um, beyond the numbers, um, these, this change in population has brought about uh, a change in the character of the country uh, in terms of its racial makeup. Um, this graph shows you simply the, the percent of the population that uh, is classified as non-Hispanic white in different age cohorts. Uh, and if you look at uh, the older population, people 65 and above, uh, that was a country that was 80% white. Um, you, you go down in age, uh, to the population that's now less than five years old, uh, and you're talking about a country that's about half white. Um, this is a fundamental, dramatic, extraordinary change in the nature of our society, um, and to my mind is um, as important um, as those numbers um, in explaining why the Latino vote matters. To a certain extent, uh, the Latino population is viewed as the vehicle for this change. Um, a great deal of agency is ascribed to the Hispanic population uh, in terms of bringing about this change. Uh, it's, there's a much longer conversation about why this happened, uh, what the factors involved were in terms of attracting immigrant workers, changes in fertility, all kinds of uh, different factors, but uh, there's an enormous protagonism that's ascribed to Hispanics as being uh, the population that brought about this fundamental change in the country. Um, there is, however, a, a very profound disjuncture between this reality um, and what happens at the voting booth, uh, because you can see the very, uh, the, the very deep change happens among young people. If you look at a schoolyard, it's a very different America than if you look at a workplace um, or a retirement home. Uh, but school children don't vote. They only depend on voters. Um, so you have to ask how that population growth happened. Uh, what were the engines of it? And there are basically two ways populations grow. Uh, one is by birth. Uh, if you have a lot of babies, you have more babies than other segments of the population, that segment of the population grows faster. That's what happened among Hispanics, particularly uh, mothers um, who were born outside the United States, immigrant mothers, uh, have had fertility rates significantly higher than that of native-born, whether they be Latino or white, and, um, uh, and even native-born Latino women have had higher fertility rates than um, uh, than white women. Uh, but a, a child takes 18 years to become a voter. Um, there's no way around that. It's simply, you know, the, it is a simple chronological process. That 50% America of um, under five years old will become the electorate sometime 15, 20, 25 years from now. Um, the, the America that votes is quite different. 
Um, additionally, the other mechanism for growth, one that was very important to the Hispanic population at the early stages of its growth, um, is immigration. Um, and as we all know, a large share of Hispanic immigrants um, have come here uh, without authorization and as a result aren't eligible for citizenship. Um, and so they're not voters now. They won't be voters unless there's some substantial change in the law. Um, so this produces a very peculiar kind of math um, in terms of the, the, um, how you get from population to electorate. Um, the fact of the matter is that almost 60% of all Latinos, 58% in 2010, um, aren't eligible to vote, either because they're too young, that's about a th uh, something more than a third of the total population, um, or they're not citizens, which is about another quarter of the population. Um, they're simply, on election day, they have no, no role to play. They have no voice um, in our civic affairs. Um, you compare that to uh, other s racial segments of the population just to get a sense of it. So about 42, 43 percent of the Hispanic population um, is eligible to vote um, compared to 77, 78 percent of the white population, um, uh, 67 percent of the African American population that has a, a larger share of young people and, there's, and there is a, a proportion of, of immigrants. But an even quite smaller than the Asian population in part because the growth has been driven so much by, um, by births. Um, so we'll do the math. You start out with 50 million people. Um, you subtract the under 18s, you get to 33 million adults. Um, subtract the non-citizens, um, you get to 21 million voters. Um, you've, you've taken out a whole lot of people. Uh, from that initial impression, the, the impression of size and growth and change in the country to uh, actual political muscle. Um, when you then look at registration, um, these are 20, um, 2010 numbers. Um, you, you get uh, substantial under activity um, and in voting as well. So you go from 50 million people to 7 million voters um, in the 2010 election. Um, even if you figure in a presidential election you'll get uh, substantially more, you're still going to go from uh, 51, 52 million to maybe 12 million voters, 11 million voters. Um, it's, it's a very uh, wicked bit of math in terms of going from population to, um, to voting power. Um, beyond that, there's geography. Um, where do these voters sit? Um, they're highly concentrated in a few places. Um, as you can see, about 54% of all Latino voters are in three states, uh, none of which matters in a presidential election. They're all already decided. If you throw in Illinois, Massachusetts, a few other, you know, the other states with substantial Hispanic populations that are already basically decided, you get up to about 60, 60, 5%, depending on how you count it, of the Hispanic electorate, this is of those P, the 21 million who can vote, who are sitting somewhere that doesn't really matter. Um, if you look at, um, let's look at, the, at, at battleground states. Um, so this is share of total turnout in 2008, uh, calculations by, by Nate Silver at 5, um, uh, 5, 538.com. Uh, Florida obviously matters a lot. 15% of the total vote in 2008 was Latino. Uh, Florida is also totally sui generis. Raises the question of why we should have a discussion about, you can't talk about a Hispanic vote. The first piece of evidence in that is Florida, which is a complete outlier in every way in terms of its politics, but especially in terms of its Hispanic politics, and not just because of the old Cuban Republican vote, but because of new Puerto Rican voters, new naturalized Latin South American voters, a whole hodgepodge uh, of voters. In, in central Florida, you've got a Latino population that doesn't look like uh, a Latino population anywhere else in the country, a mix of, uh, of Puerto Ricans off the island, Puerto Ricans who've come from New York, and people who've come from Latin America. Um, Beyond that, um, you get into um, some of the states where um, you've got substantial representation that might 
uh, where they're in, that are currently on the map. Uh, in this case, really, Colorado and Nevada are the only two states with more than 10 percent elect uh, Hispanic voters that are currently considered battleground states. Um, the other element of the Hispanic vote that you've got to consider, particularly when you're looking at the Mexican-American vote in the Intermountain West, um, is that it, it operates in a very narrow partisan band. Um, George Bush did very well in 2004 at getting 40 percent, maybe 42 percent of the Hispanic vote nationally. Um, Bob Dole did very poorly getting 35 percent, maybe 33 percent. Um, a Democrat that gets 60 percent is considered to be just basically hanging on. 65 percent is considered doing well. You're talking about a very narrow margin of difference. They're very consistent in terms of the partisan split. Um, so you're talking in these states, um, in Colorado and Nevada, very narrow potential differences um, that could, if you, in, in, in a whisk, an election decided by a whisker, you're talking about whether, you know, a four or five percent shift in the Latino vote in Colorado will produce a, a 0.2 percent, 0.3 percent difference in the total vote, well, that might actually make a difference. Uh, and the way the maps are playing out, it could make a difference. Meanwhile, the big battlegrounds, the places where the election's really going to be decided, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, there, there's, no, there's not a Latino vote to speak of. Um, so you end up in this election, in my mind, um, very nearly arguing this out, uh, where the Latino vote could shift the presidential election in relatively few places. I mean, you could be um, overly uh, small about it and talk about f certain areas of Las Vegas and the Denver metropolitan areas where a couple of 100,000 Latino voters going one way or another, uh, a split of 70-30 instead of 60-40 uh, ends up making a difference. Um, that becomes a very difficult way to run a large-scale political mobilization. Um, I'm going to leave. I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, I've been told my time is up, um, so I'm just going to point very quickly to the other reason we care, which is looking to the future. Um, there. This population, as you, we saw in that at the beginning, in that 50 percent America, um, is very heavily Latino. Um, you've got, um, and they're all citizens. Under 18 years old, you don't get a lot of immigrants. About 92 percent of them um, are eligible voters of the, the 17 million Latinos under 18 years old. Um, and they end up being a very significant share of that electorate. Um, if you so look at 15 to 19 year olds, uh, the oncoming voters in the next two cycles, um, you've got about 6.7 million Latinos out of 22 million total. That means about three, 30 percent, almost one out of every three voters who's coming, who's aging into the electorate uh, in the future will be a Latino. And that's in a very large sense, what I'll conclude with is this, the discussion of the Latino voters is a discussion about the future of politics, not about this cycle. Um, and where, will, what, where this cycle could have a big difference um, is in how it casts trajectories looking to the future um, and what it does to these people. Um, to the young people who are watching this election and who are going to be coming on stream in very large numbers uh, in the next couple of presidential cycles uh, and could have a huge impact uh, going forward. Uh, thank you, and we'll talk about this more. Thanks. Yeah.